to thank you all for coming um, for this what's going to be an extremely interesting lecture on gems, something we uh, don't really have that much, um, by our Polish friend and colleague, Pali Pavel <laughs> Goliszniak, <laughs> and now <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so this will now test me and my Polish. Um, but leaving that aside, he works as a research fellow and in the Institute of Archaeology in Krakow. He's published the Catalogue and Study of Ancient Engraved Gems collection from the National Museum in Krakow. In fact, I will um, come to this. Um, accomplished the study of the okay another Polish family collection, which I will not pronounce, and he will then tell you more about because then Elena will have a fit. <laughs> <laughs> and this collection has cylinder seals, intaglios, cameos, and amulets. Uh, and this is in press, as well as many articles in the field. And this is something at an incredibly young age. Um, he has really achieved, has become a great authority in this field of gems. And we're extremely pleased that um, he's come here to the American Numismatic Society to also look at our gems and some of our holdings. Um, his research interests, though, include also, apart from these engraved gems, and here he doesn't look just at ancient, but also at neoclassical gems. Um, he looks at Roman Republican and Augustan numismatics, history of antiquarianism, collecting and scholarship, as well as 18th century drawings of intaglios and cameos, and the legacy of antiquary and connoisseur Philip von Storch, really easy. <coughs> and um, with these words, I just want to say that anyone who's interested in publishing at a very steep discount, his most recent book that the ANS um, helped fund, um, it is here, and I believe the price is $25 at a normal 175 euros. So this is the bargain if you want one. But I will now hand over to Pavel. Thank you. So um, thank you very much for the lovely introduction and um, I'm really pleased to be here and to speak in front of a, such a wonderful audience about engraved gems, of course. Um, yeah, so f first of all I would like to, to thank Ute for the, her kind invitation and also to thank Jonathan for the outstanding hospitality while I'm here in New York studying gems from the INS collection. And yes, so while we were discussing the, um, the subject of this presentation, uh, we thought that it might be a good idea to uh, produce a sort of introduction to the GEMS world for you. And so you will hear in the first part of this presentation about engraved GEMS, what they are, and uh, an overview of engraved GEMS in antiquity will be presented to you too. And uh, then we will turn into the subject of gems and coins relationships. So I would like to approach this issue at three levels, let's say, whether there are some technical similarities, uh, content similarities, and finally, functional similarities. Um, so have you ever heard about engraved gems? So this is the first question, right? A couple of people I see know it, so yeah, so, so you've heard about this. So anybody recognizes this one? Of course, right? So this is the Great Camille of France, uh, a masterpiece of Roman imperial glyptics dated to the second quarter of the first century AD. It basically represents Julio-Claudian family, right? And, and it was probably carved because of the adoption of uh, Tiberius um, sons and, and, and it celebrated that event. And you can see there is a Tiberius in, in the center, sitting on the throne, and, and there is Augustus in the upper register over here. And of course the barbarians defeated by the Romans in the lower register too. But um, so as you can see, there is an immense information inf in one piece only. But what is interesting about engraved gems, and specifically about this one is, that they carry a lot of history with them too, because the Great Camille of France was uh, was was carved in Rome itself, right? But then it turned to uh, it it traveled to Constantinople while while it became a capital city of the Roman Empire, and then uh, the Emperor of the Latin Empire in 13th century Baldwin II sold the uh, the, the Camille to the French King Louis VI, so it traveled back to the Western Europe to France. 
And uh, when the French kings were in the need, they uh, just passed it to the Pope Clement VI. Uh, and they reclaim it in the 14th century. And what is interesting that this gem specifically was uh, reinterpreted during the medieval period. Uh, it was thought to represent the triumph of Josephus uh, at the Pharaoh court. Um, so you can see that it depending on the period, you know, gems could be interpreted in a very different way. Uh, then it was uh, twice stolen in 1804 and in 1912, so it lost its original setting, but it survived and is presented right now in the Cabinet de Medaille in Paris, where you can admire it. But so this actually tells us also another interesting thing about engraved gems, because they were extremely popular uh, since the Renaissance times until the 19th century as collectibles. So they were collected by many, by by the kings, by by emperors, by aristocrats. And, uh, so um, and and actually, this collecting thing happened already in antiquity. So do you recognize this person? Right, Mithridates the sixth so Pater, right? And here is Julius Caesar. So the connection between these two is that they were both collectors of gems, actually, which is scarcely known. Um, yeah, and here we have uh, two people from the modern era, the last king of Poland, Stanisław August Poniatowski, who collected almost 400 of, of, of gems. Uh, and Catherine the Great, who was crazy about gems, uh, she collected thousands of them, actually. Um, yeah, and, and gems were very inspirational to the modern artists as well, right? Here you can see mm, uh, Peter Paul Rubens' work, I mean, the painting of the great, Cam inspired by the great Camille of France, of course, and the painting hangs right now in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, but also, you know, people like Sigmund Freud also collected gems and were inspired by them. So, so you can see there are collecting was a very important part of, of the gem world. And the third um, thing related to gems is they contributed a lot to the development of archaeology as, archaeological, uh, as a scientific discipline. And, uh, here you can see Philippe von Stosch and, and he contributed with a very important publication in uh, 1724. He published uh, a book about signet gems and ancient signet gems. And this was a landmark because he was followed by Johann Joachim Winkelmann. And Winkelmann cataloged Stoch collection in 1760. But uh, as you can see, it is not a coincidence that the best gem from the Stoch collection appeared at the front piece of, of the most important work of Winkelmann, right? The Geschichte der Kunst des Altertums. Now here you can see another great figure uh, related to uh, engraved gems world, uh, Adolf Wengler, who was called uh, Linnaeus of archaeology, right, because he amassed vast amounts of, of material, uh, including engraved gems. He studied them carefully and classified, put into their chronological order. And even though his book published in 19... Uh, 19th century, I mean, the, at the end of the 19th century, is still valid today. So... And here you can see an example of a scholar, John Sir John Boardman, who also studies gems. So there are not many scholars actually studying gems, but some of them do, and, and they do this really well. So what are engraved gems? So glyptics, generally speaking, is an art of engraving precious and semi-precious stones mm, uh, with small images. Uh, gem is a precious stone which is given that image and it is carved into its uh, into a stone's surface that we are calling it in Italio. And when the gem is decorated in relief, we call it cameo. Um, and gem engraver is an artist who produced engraved gems. So here you can see in an overview of, you know, sort of types of gemstones which were used in antiquity. This is just to show you how diverse this art is and starting from the material itself. Uh, uh, and of course, other materials than hard stones were used in antiquity, like slate, gold, silver, bronze, and glass was really important, especially in the Hellenistic and Roman Republican periods. And coral and bone are less uh, were less popular. And we used to refer to Moxke in terms of mm, distinguishing gems between themselves, how hard they were, and difficult to, to, to engrave in. Here you can see a map that illustrates where the gems were supplied to the Mediterranean world. So basically, in, uh, India and Sri Lanka, like today, was the most important uh, region where the gems came from. 
And uh, another really important region was Anatolia, and in Egypt there were also some sources for engraved stones, but some specific stones were really popular everywhere, like, uh, like agate, for instance, was abundant in Sicily, but some were not that popular, like uh, lapis lazuli, which was almost exclusively connected to Afghanistan uh, in antiquity. Uh, so some of them were really rare, and that helps us to understand the road trade roads uh, how they functioned uh, in terms of gems. Uh, you might wonder how the production process looked like. So basically we think that there were two types of craftsmen producing engraved gems. So the first type focused on preparations of the rough material, right, the, the stone itself. Mm, uh, and then another artist came in with an idea of its decoration and he executed it. But generally speaking, the process can be described like the uh, stone rough stone preparation, then it was shaped, uh, then the concept must have been born and, and it visualized somehow on the stone itself. The artist made the preparatory sketch and cut the major parts of the depiction, and then uh, he added some detailing and polished everything and, and the gem could be set into, uh, into a mount. Uh, we can reconstruct these ancient techniques based on both uh, ancient and modern uh, sources. The earliest engraved gems were cut in the late Neolithic period, actually, with hand, with simple flint, obsidian or copper tools, mainly chisels. But uh, around the mid of the 4th millennium BC, in Mesopotamia, Cinderacius engravers start to engrave them with uh, hardened uh, bronze uh, wheel, uh, cutting wheels and pointed drills. And they started to use the combination of oil and emery powders. That helps them to work with uh, much harder materials. And uh, around the 5th century BC, the Greeks uh, invented the diamond tipped drill uh, and its introduction actually allowed them to do much uh, much more with the stones. Mm, uh, here you can see on the top the reconstruction of a bow drill which was used in antiquity. Basically it functioned like a saw while we are cutting wood, right? So that the, the drill could rotate and cut the gem. And, and, here, oh sorry. and here you can see a drawing uh, reconstructing a sort of tomb decoration where the bow drill is in action. Uh, and here you can see the bow drill, of course, uh, in the top of this fragment of a tombstone of en gem engraver Doros from Sardes. Uh, we can see that in from, from modern sources that uh, tools didn't change that much over this past, let's say, two thousands of years. The same drills were used, but the only uh, new thing is electricity, which drives drills right now. Um, gems were mounted in various objects, right, but mainly they were mounted in rings. They were used as ring stones, mm, uh, but they also were set in uh, necklaces, brooches, bracelets, earrings, you name it. So, um, and the there are basically three uh, most important uh, functions attached to engraved gems. They were used as seals. They were invented before the actual writing system was invented. So there was a need for authorization and secure of various documents, letters, correspondence, uh, contract, trade contracts, whatever, right? So, so they were sort of signatures for the ancient people. Uh, these seals were used uh, so that the, the image could be impressed on a wet clay. And, and, and here you have some two examples of, of the uh, cylinder seals which were used in Near East in the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC. Uh, these uh, cylinder seals were used on clay tablets, but of course some of them were also used um, uh, to produce ceilings themselves in other forms. So, but what we can actually learn from engraved gems, gemstones, this is rather interesting because uh, there is a lot of information which we can get from them. So they are useful for dating sometimes, uh, for archaeological layers when they are found them uh, at, uh, at the archaeological excavations. But the rich iconography and inscriptions are really perfect literary and iconographical sources to reconstruct the past. Information can be obtained about local administration and state government, about relationships between people, about the ancient economy, especially trade, uh, about religious practices, rituals, magics, in daily life, architecture, means of transport, fashion, you name it, everything is over there, believe me, on, uh, on engraved gems. Um, so cylinder seals were a dominant form of engraved gems in the Near East in antiquity. 
Uh, but um, in uh, Egypt, in ancient Egypt, this form took uh, a scarab. So the scarabs uh, could be also seals, of course, right? But some, some of them also, for instance, like this example here from the British Museum, uh, commemorated successes in hunting for white bulls of, uh, of Pharaoh Hamenhotep III. So gems could commemorate important events. They were used for propaganda purposes, for, uh, but they reflect, this is probably the most important thing, they reflect personal tastes and preferences. They expressed a sort of self-presentation. People used to manifest their beliefs, religion, philosophy, or political affinity. And they were important family heirlooms because we have evidence that they were passed from one generation to another. Um, yeah, so I mentioned that this, this use was the primary function for gems, of course, right? But many of them were used also as amulets to protect people, their owners, to uh, ensure with blessings of various deities. So they were used as amulets, but they also uh, testified to crossing of cultural borders, like the form of the scarab, so popular in Egypt, actually was adopted by the Phoenicians. Here you can see the Phoenician scarab. And that scarab form was then adopted by the Etruscans and even the Greeks in the 6th century BC, uh, carved the gems in the form of a scarab. Uh, gems were used, of course, for decoration, for personal adornment, uh, as jewelry pieces and show pieces. Mm, uh, the best of them were carved by uh, masters who, at the point of, let's say, 5th century BC in Greece, started to put their signatures. Uh, so that the employment of a gem, because employment of gem engravers uh, showed the special social status the, uh, of, of the person who, uh, who decided to have such a gem carved. Uh, and it was a confirmation of its wealth because they were extremely costly products of antiquity. So here you can see two examples of scaraboids because in the 5th century BC, uh, the Greeks started to simplify the scarab form so that the back of the of the gem was flat rather than uh, rather than in the form of a scarab, and they are carved with beautiful images, of course. Uh, at the point of Hellenistic age, uh, gems started to become. I mean, new form was born, like the cameo. Mm, uh, the cameos were products of luxury, of course, and not many could afford them. Pr mainly, probably the the royal families. And here you can see two examples. Uh, stating to that, and including the famous Tatsa Farnese. Mm, uh, so gems could be also engraved in the form of cameos, but also in cameo vessels, we call them. Um, but uh, at the point of Hellenistic uh, times, we observed that gems started to be more and more politically significant. So that we have evidence from the literary sources that, for instance, Pergoteles was the, uh, the only one engraver of gems who could uh, cut portraits of Alexander the Great. And also we find in literary sources evidence that specific gems were used, especially those with portraits, mm, uh, to express political affinity to one party or another. So this was important, and, and this is even more important uh, when we are speaking about the Roman uh, culture. In, uh, uh, for the Romans, the most important uh, form of gemstones were ringstones, intaglios, set into the rings, like here. And in the first century BC, very popular became uh, gems made of glass. They were made of from out of matrices, uh, prepared beforehand so that they were molded. And because they were relatively cheap, and, and at the point of first century BC, Rome was crazy about gems, and everybody wanted to have one. So that the artists started to produce uh, cheaper, uh, I mean gems executed in cheaper materials, mm, uh, like glass, uh, that imitated the actual uh, gemstones. Um, but we can find evidence also that gems were imported social status makers, like uh, a good case is that of Marius because he appeared during his triumph with a gold ring engraved with, uh, with a gem, mm, uh, whereas he's supposed to be appear with an iron, simple iron ring uh, to show his modesty in Pietas. That backfired actually him. Uh, but, um, but we also hear that uh, Lucullus, while he was visiting the Ptolemaic court, Mm, he received a gold ring with a uh, portrait engraved upon it uh, of the Ptolemy the Nymph, and he had to accept this 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 ring. So, mm, uh, so gems were also exchanged as the, mm, diplomatic gifts. 
And at the point when uh, them became Dems became really important uh, for the Romans when Pompey the Great came back from his uh, campaign from 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 East, and he brought the Dactyliotheca, which is the word for collection of gems in antiquity. Mm, uh, that one of Mitridates, King Mitridates the Sixth Eupator, and he consecrated that uh, collection to the Temple of Jupiter at the Capitoline Hill. Um, gems became really important, and especially the cameos uh, during the Augustus times uh, when they commemorated important events. And here you have an example from uh, from the Metropolitan Museum here from New York. Um, and and of course, gems continued to be produced in the Roman Imperial period. And this is interesting uh, photograph of gems which were found uh, in Bath, in England, uh, at the drainage pipes, uh, because people used to go to Bath themselves with their rings on their fingers, and sometimes they slept off their fingers, and sometimes the gem themselves just fell uh, apart from the finger ring, and and were lost in the drainage. And the archaeologists, when while they was doing the field work. Uh, they found uh, 88 gems at the end of one of the pipes uh, collected from them. So, so that's uh, that's amazing, actually. Um, yeah, but but some of the gems were also given a sort of form of statuettes, like like these two examples here: one from the Getty, the second from the Princeton University Art Museum. Um, this one were uh, used to for private calls, but they were extremely expensive uh, items, for sure. Uh, in the in the imperi Roman Imperial period, uh, magical gems and amulets became really popular too. And they were used for creative and protective purposes, as I said before, like this gem with Knubis was supposed to mm, help with some digestive problems and with a stomach in general. Whereas here we have a sort of combination uh, that stands for three gods, actually. We have cockerel's uh, legs over here that refers to Mercury. And I mean, this refers to the cockerel itself, of course, but he was a sacred uh, bird of Mercury. We have a Silenus mask over here and elephant's uh, head with tusk and, 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 and trump uh, holding a palm branch, which represents uh, Bacchus' Indian triumph, of course. And the whole creature uh, looks like a peacock that was a sacred bird to goddess Juno. So the owner had protection and blessing from three gods uh, in one, actually, like here. And during the late antique times, like in the 3rd century AD, unfortunately, gems started to fade away because they were luxury products and because the economy uh, mostly collapsed, the gems uh, started to be less and less popular. Of course, some of them, I mean, the masterpieces were created at the court of uh, of the Iran um, emperors, but casual gems were also engraved, sometimes with wonderful messages, like here. Here is the inscription uh, surrounding that that uh, that hand pinching the ear, which we can read, like "Remember me and my good soul, your dear sweetheart." So this is a beautiful message from somebody who actually passed away to the person who who left him. Mm, uh, but gems are simplified, and and the the last category of gems which we can somehow connect to to antiquity are early Christian gems. They were obviously um, furnished with with uh, scenes from the Bible and also the symbolism of Christianity, and and this is a sort of overview of engraved gems in antiquity. Very brief one, uh, but um, we we are turning to the second part of this lecture, which are gems and coins relationships and. First, I would like to consider the technical similarities. So it might look like gems, really small objects, are comparable to, to, to coins, which are also really small. And they share their, uh, their shapes uh, also they ha they because they are circular or oval shape, mostly. Uh, but when we start to investigate this issue deeper, it turns out that we might uh, see the problems because the engraving process itself might have looked the same in case of engraved gems and coins. As it was explained, uh, we, can, uh, we can imagine that when production of coins was started to be I mean, when the coin was was pr was produced, there was the same process. Like uh, there was a rough material preparation, right? The piece of metal must have been first prepared, and then there was a visualization of what is going to be put on that coin, and so on. So we can see similarities 
with them too. But the question is whether the same repertoire of tools was used for both gems and coins. So not really, because uh, because coin dyes can be uh, can be prepared with chisels because metal is much softer than the hard stones mostly. But um, but the hard stones. Uh, for 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 engraving the hardstones re required much uh, completely different uh, set of tools. Uh, however, there is a bridge between uh, gems and and coins, which are uh, engraved finger rings. They might they were made of gold and silver and bronze, so the same material as the coins were actually. Mm, uh, so there is a bridge, but the problem is that uh, finger rings were popular during the Hellenistic, I mean, uh, cl uh, Greek or classical period and Hellenistic period, but they st stopped to be so popular during the Roman period. There are not many examples of gold rings or silver rings engraved uh, in the Roman times with portraits or, or other scenes. Um, yeah, so. So, so the question is whether uh, gem engraver could easily learn how to cut coin dice and vice versa. We suppose that it was not that super difficult for a gem engraver to, to cut uh, coin die, for instance, too, because when he was trained and had skills enough to produce uh, something in hardstone, it was much easier for him to cut uh, simple, mm, simply in metal. But the other way around might have been a little bit more uh, difficult. But the ultimate goal was to create actually a negative form later used to make a positive one. In case of gems, it was an impression, usually. N uh, in case of coin die, a coin. But the problem is that many gems actually were not used for ceilings, especially in the Roman, uh, Roman times, because they functioned as amulets. So they were used not uh, actually in a negative form rather than a positive one. Uh, coin dice makers, I mean, there is another question uh, for the uh, sort of technical similarities is whether the coin dice makers frequently traveled, and examples are, for instance, the Wynetos who worked in several places on Sic Sicily, mm, uh, and later also Procles who started to work in Katana, and also we found his works on Naxos. Mm, uh, so it is generally believed that German engravers were also uh, quite mobile. And that's actually even probably they were even more mobile than the coin die makers were because what we imagine how coins were product they must have been set in one place uh, under authority of a specific person usually king or uh, emperor, uh, but 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 gems of course they were also made uh, on the commission. Uh, usually a private one. Of course, some workshops, uh, this will be discussed later, but some workshops functioned at the Imperial Roman Imperial Court. Uh, but generally speaking, the commission itself is a private, uh, private commission, was still in its nature like a commission of coins, right? So somebody wanted a specific design to be carved on a, on a gemstone on its private seal. So so we can imagine that actually there is a mm, similarity between these two uh, uh, at this issue. So and and we we have an examples that coin dice makers traveled and and of course gem makers also traveled a lot. Especially in the first century BC, we observed that a lot of uh, Greek gem engravers uh, transferred their businesses back to I mean to to the western part of the Mediterranean basin because they. Uh, sought for uh, for new markets where could where they could produce and sell their products. Now the question of style is of course very difficult to answer. But but even when we have example, we, we can find examples of uh, the same design produced on gems and coins or finger rings. Still, the style sometimes is not distinctive enough, or it is completely different. So. That means we cannot uh, say that uh, even the design is the same, mm, uh, the same hand work on, on both products. But uh, we can point to at least two examples when it is quite probable that uh, both gems and, and coins were produced by the same artist. And an example of this is a Frigillos who worked uh, on Tetragasm of Syracuse and later also on the Silver Statue of Tauroi. And we find two gems signed by Frigil some Frigilus too. And when we start to compare the style, for instance, of I mean the, the elegant face of Eros with you know the face of this god and, and Athena. So 
we start to believe that slowly he might have produced actually both gems and coins alike. And uh, comparing the fleshy muscles of this bull with, uh, with the body of Heracles over here, when the emphasis is put on the muscles very clearly too, this makes uh, this this starts to make sense however we must be very careful when we compare gems and coins in this time because here is another example mm -hmm. uh, there is a calling of uh, arcadian league starter uh, which is signed over here i mean there is a name which we uh, read as olympus and there is a gem engraver who signed it himself as olympus as well here um, so the question is whether this could be the same person, but the problem is that actually the name appearing on the coin might refer to the administrator of the mint actually, so he necessarily, he, he doesn't have to be necessarily the name of the actual engraver. So it, this, in this case, uh, these two signatures might be totally coincidental, mm, uh, close. But uh, in the Hellenistic period, uh, we have information uh, in the literary sources, we find them, that uh, German engravers worked uh, on uh, royal commissions. And here is an example of Nicandros, who, who cut uh, gems with portraits of Ptolemaic uh, kings and queens. And when we carefully uh, study the style of, this, of these portraits, we found them strikingly close to those produced on uh, actual coins of the Ptolemaic mm, uh, rulers. Uh, and here is an example from the Roman Republic where you can see actually this is the glass gem. Uh, the glass gem which was produced uh, directly after the coin itself, right? It was a replica of a coin uh, and we can assume that actually the matrix itself could be prepared by um, by the same artist who was responsible for coin production <laughs> yeah so going further to the content similarities of course as you can already seen uh, sometimes gems and coins share their iconography and this might be for several reasons mm, so gem engravers copied devices from coins because they were easily accessible. So this might be the first uh, case. Uh, there is an interesting theory uh, drew by Anit Hamburger and Martin Henning that there were book patterns circulating around the Mediterranean world uh, so that the artist could take uh, inspiration from one source. And of course, um, sometimes the similarities in terms of uh, content appearing on both gems and coins can be totally coincidental because the source of inspiration was the same, right? The, a cult statue or a painting mm, uh, could serve as a source of inspiration for both artists. So uh, when we find the same design on gems and coins, it doesn't automatically mean that the same person, of course, made it. Um, but the question, the, the real question is where gem engravers fear of choice the, the, the dev of the devices they used or to put on the gems? Or did they actually work strictly according to the commission uh, they have to execute like coin die makers? Uh, as I said before, uh, usually gem engravers worked uh, strictly on the commission, a private one, because somebody wanted something specific for, its seal, for, for his seal. But we can imagine that uh, the market also worked in a slightly different way, that so that the gem engravers could produce some amount of gems just for a general public, like amulets, for instance, right? And then they were fear of choice rather than coin die makers. Mm, uh, but, but we can find examples, especially if glass gems are concerned, that the design is directly copied from coins themselves. Like here, even the signature is copied. Uh, in this case. And, and here is another interesting example when we can find, uh, I mean, coins are extremely helpful to identify persons uh, that are depicted on gems. And here might be the case uh, where Titus Quinticus Laminius is represented on the gem, signed by Daedalos, uh, a Greek engraver. And it is interesting to see that in the during the second century BC, more and more Romans traveling to the eastern part of the Mediterranean world start to produce gems. I mean, they start to commission gems with their own portraits because it was unpopular uh, in the western part of Mediterranean, in Rome itself. Uh, but they start to follow uh, their Hellenistic counterparts and put uh, their own uh, portraits on gems. So. Uh, so this mm, this is an example also quite I illustrating 
the fact that sometimes gems and coins share uh, the content in terms of uh, the same sort of propaganda actions. Like we know for the fact that uh, coin die makers, I mean, or the commissioners used to advertise, um, used to advertise their family stories on coins, especially during the end of the second uh, century BC and and first half of the first century BC. Um, and we find uh, similar designs on coin uh, on gems uh, too, which might indicate that some members of these families used to mm, used to have the seals that represented the same things as the coins did. But we must be careful again because in terms of coins we are in a better position since we can relate somehow the pictures they depict to the persons because there are inscriptions and we I mean usually not 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 always but but many times we know who actually was responsible for coin for specific coin production. Uh, like in this case, uh, Ulysses appears on this coin because uh, Mamilia, it was a symbol of uh, Mamilia family. Uh, who descended from uh, Mamilia, who was daughter of Telegonus, and Telegonus was son of uh, Ulysses himself. N uh, and when we have uh, almost exactly the same depiction on a gem, uh, of course we can suppose that uh, that the gem served as a seal of a m member of uh, Mamilia family. But on the other hand, there are multiple other explanations for gems, which make them difficult to study, but much more enjoyable because you have many other options. So in this case, uh, actually that Ulysses might represent mm, a persistence. Of course, he was a perfect choice for a seal because of the secrecy surrounding his personality. And since uh, seals were supposed to uh, also mm, keep secrecy to the documents they were used on, he, he makes a perfect choice for a seal. Uh, but he was also a patron to at least 10 cities in Central and Southern Italy. Uh, so he might have served as a local authority uh, or something like that. Uh, in terms of portraits, of course, portraits again in the Roman uh, period, they are uh, represented on both gems and coins alike. And we can see that they were used for the same reasons, actually, to advertise uh, political leaders. And we hear uh, from the literary sources that uh, actually followers of, of these political leaders used to have rings with gems engraved with portraits of their leaders. And uh, in this case, this is the, the famous gem representing uh, Sixtus Pompey, as we suppose, from Antiken Sammlung in Berlin. And we hear from Florus that uh, followers of Sextus, after the loss of Battle of Naulochus, used to throw away their rings uh, with, with his portraits to be not recognized mm, as, the, as his followers anymore. Uh, and here you have just a few more examples of, of the same designs of coins. And coins help us to date gems, of course, right? Because coins are much more, mm, uh, much, much less difficult to, to date than coins are, and thanks to coins we can date them quite precisely and identify the subjects. And finally we arrive to the functional relationships. So <coughs> uh, towards the, the in, in the early first century BC we observe uh, among the Romans, uh, Roman political leaders that they used to put on their own seals very specific subjects, like in case of Sulla. Uh, it was his triumph over Jugurtha and the, his second seal represented three trophies that stood for his victories over on three continents. And uh, the actual seals didn't survive, but, but, but we know how they more or less how they look like thanks to the coins, of course, mm, uh, because they are these images were recreated a little bit later by the son of Sulla. Uh, in case of Pompey the Great, uh, he uh, sealed. He, I mean, he used to have a seal with three trophies that represented his triumphs on uh, three continents as well. But, uh, but in his case, he also mm, uh, used to seal, uh, especially in for the uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, territory, a seal. He used to he used a seal with lion holding a sword. Uh, which was a reflection of a seal that Alexander the Great uh, used to used to use. So we observe imitator and Alexandri in his case. Um, and thanks to the coins, we can recreate these images and uh, visualize how they look like. In case of Julius Caesar, he used to uh, he used a seal with Venus Vitrix uh, that is represented in his coinage uh, too. 
Mm, uh, but uh, it is important to remember that uh, gems were really private uh, sphere. Uh, and, and this is why on this intaglio, uh, now in Bibliothèque Nationale in France, but found in Egypt, we find uh, a portrait of uh, Julius Caesar crowned with a laurel wreath, but there is also a sort of floral diadem over here. Uh, an image which would be not accepted in Rome, but in the Eastern Mediterranean it was perfectly okay, because people used to this royal uh, symbols uh, due to the Ptolemies and Seleucids and other dynasties. So glyptics actually offered much more in terms of advertisement rather than coins sometimes. And here's another interesting example, the cameo uh, from the content collection, but it was found in Tarragona. Tarragona was elevated to the Roman colony in 45 BC by Julius Caesar himself. And we may wonder whether this piece was given to a sort of uh, representative of local authority by on the commission of Julius Caesar, or the, uh, the person who, who from Tarragona actually commissioned something that would represent his patron, Julius Caesar. Uh, Julius Caesar is represented here uh, with Venus, his, uh, his divine patroness, uh, quite directly, uh, and we find the same reference on his coins, as I, as I said before. Uh, we observe, in terms of gems and coins relationships, functional relationships, we observe that the same uh, propaganda functions works in both media. Here we have an example of a denarius minted by Sextus Pompey and Asidius when they arrived to Sicily. And, uh, and of course, mm, the point was to transfer authority of, uh, of father of Sextus, Pompey the Great, on, his on the sun. And with this authority also came reference to Neptune, uh, the god Neptune. And we observe the same, uh, uh, the same pattern in action in case of gems, which uh, represent uh, the same phenomena. Um, we can also observe on gems uh, references to, um, and thanks to the coins, we can identify them, of course, for the uh, in the first place. But we can see again that uh, gems sometimes allow to do more. Like here we have Octavian, and here is the star referring to <coughs> the comet that appeared after Julius Caesar's funeral. And, and here, is, uh, here is a bunch of examples of how diverse this iconography referring to Octavian was. And, mm, uh, and in terms of glyptics, he was uh, such, uh, really successful in terms of self-advertisement. Uh, there are many examples of gems usually made of glass, cheap glass, that were later on passed to his followers uh, so that they could, mm, uh, they could manifest uh, loyalty and, and to the today patron. Um, but in case of Octavian, we also hear that his seal represented a sphinx, and we find very same sphinx on hi in his coinage as well. And finally, he, his final seal uh, bore a portrait of, of uh, carved by uh, Dioscurides, who was the leader of a great imperial workshop established by Augustus himself. Now we can see that the actual image uh, appearing on gems is very is strikingly close to that one from a coin. So the image of emperor became a sort of state symbol. And uh, speaking about the imperial code workshop, so we observe that, like in case of coins, gems started to be produced. Not all of them, of course, right? But um, but many gems started to be produced in the imperial code workshop. Some of them were the best showpieces uh, used by the imperial family uh, itself. But there were others, like, like this, this is another example of beautiful uh, imperial eagle cameo from Vienna that basically uh <coughs> functions in the same way as uh, the, the Aureus of Augustus mm, uh, commemorating his title of, uh, recei recipient of his title of Augustus in 27 BC. Uh, but you can see that actually in the, tem in the times of Augustus there are many other subjects uh, that appear on both gems and coins alike, and these two uh, media are really, really close. And even uh, promotion of uh, Julio Claudian family uh, is represented in both gems and coins, like we can see uh, on this example. Um, so to conclude all of this, 
As far as technical aspects are concerned, it is difficult to prove that gem engravers actually work as coin dye makers at the same time. Uh, this does not mean, of course, there were no artists performing both professions. Uh, there is a clear gap in the research on this issue, and we should investigate it mm, deeper. Uh, work in both media, of course, is imaginable, as we could see uh, in this presentation. But due to multiple explanations for GEM's iconography, it is rather difficult uh, to state that the content was similar to that known from coins. However, some film examples where substantial similarities uh, in both media actually exist, mm, uh, meaning uh, that further research should multiply these examples. And GEM essentially share a lot with coins if it goes to their functions as propaganda uh, means and, and self-presentation. And, and this is especially clear uh, when the Roman Republic is concerned and of course times of Augustus reign. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And here I decided to put a sort of selection of literature if anybody is interested into gems after this presentation. So I recommend to choose one of these uh, books or whatever, right? But, but they are I, I just selected you know one for the specific period. So this is, <laughs> so I limited myself really. Uh, but, but, but you're encouraged to, to, to read all of them. Uh, so thank you very much for your <laughs>